In this lecture, we'll be covering the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation, which is material from chapter 19 in the book. I think that the tile slide does a, a pretty decent job at, at showing you where this is, is going on inside of the cell. Um, the electron transport chain is located in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So these, these complexes are in the inner mitochondrial membrane, okay? And, and what's going on is as electrons are being transferred through them, they're pumping protons out into the, the um, um, inner membrane space, uh, the, the area between the outer membrane of the mitochondria and the inner membrane of the mitochondria, okay? Um, and then another thing I like about this, this figure is it shows you the entry points from the citric acid cycle. So NADH, the reduced NADH from the citric acid cycle will come in through complex one. The electrons derived from it will come in through complex one. And um, we talked about the step in the citric acid cycle where succinate went to fumarate. The, those electrons um, from that step, if you remember, uh, the cofactor was, was FAD to FADH2. That cofactor is actually in complex 2, um, and succinate dehydrogenase is complex 2 of the, the electron transport chain. So that's where those electrons are coming in. Okay, And ultimately, they go to oxygen, uh, and that's what is, is creating this proton gradient. And then the proton gradient is what complex five uses to make ATP. Okay. Again, this material is in, in chapter 19. So what we're gonna be going through um, specifically is the electron transport chain, um, how that builds up what's known as the proton motive force. Uh, then the synthesis of ATP by using that proton motive force, uh, how, how this is regulated. We'll talk a little bit about how it's regulated. And then we'll talk um, you know, very briefly about cytochrome P450 and then also reactive oxygen species generation and, and apoptosis. Because that, that, you know, the, this electron transport chain can generate some reactive oxygen species and, and be sort of damaging. Um, and, and that occurs in the mitochondria. When that does occur, it, it can lead to apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. Okay. Okay. Energy from reduced fuels is used to synthesize ATP, right? That, that's not really a, a surprise. We've been talking about this, you know, <laughs> the whole time we've been talking about metabolism. Okay. And the reduced fuels that we typically use our, our carbohydrates, um, also lipids and amino acids. You know, we've been focusing pr primarily on carbohydrates as we talked about glycolysis, um, but, but lipids and amino acids are, are also important fuels for the cell. Okay. The electrons from these reduced fuels are transferred to the cofactors NADH and FADH2, as we've seen. Okay. In oxidative phosphorylation, the energy that's stored in NADH and FADH2 are used to make ATP. Okay. So the, the pathways we've talked about so far, uh, glycolysis and the citric acid cycle are generating these reduced cofactors. In oxidative phosphorylation and electron uh, transport, those cofactors then are used to make ATP. Okay, so we, we showed the three stages of, of cellular respiration or metabolism, right? Um, stage three is what we're going to be talking about today. You know, up until this point, we're, we're focused on the electrons we're generating in NADH and FADH2. Now we're going to be putting those electrons to work and making ATP. Okay. And, and that's where this term oxidative phosphorylation comes in. Uh, oxidative in that you're oxidizing reduced fuels and, and phosphorylation in that you, you are phosphorylating ADP into ATP. Okay. So the electrons that were uh, stored in NADH and FADH2 are going to be passed to proteins in the respiratory chain. 
in eukaryotes, oxygen is going to be the ultimate electron acceptor for those electrons. Okay. And then the energy of that, um, from that, of these oxidations of the reduced fuels are used to phosphorylate ADP. Okay. Now, if we look at this a little bit closer, right, we have these electrons from our reduced carriers being transferred to the respiratory chain, also referred to as the uh, electron transport chain. Okay. That goes, those electrons go into ultimately um, converting oxygen into water, right? And that's why we need to breathe oxygen is to keep this whole process going, okay? And that um, is ultimately, um, that transfer of electrons is ultimately used to, to create ATP. And we'll, we'll see the details of that um, throughout this lecture. Um, just as a, an aside uh, for your information, um, plants can use light to kind of accomplish this same sort of process. It's called photophosphorylation. Um, light causes a, a charge separation between chlorophyll molecules, and then that, that energy difference um, between the oxidized and reduced chlorophyll molecules is what's used to drive ATP synthesis. Right. Um, wa it's a little bit different because water is the source of the electrons okay, um, that are passed to the ultimate electron acceptor, which is the, the oxidized NADP+. Plus, okay. And then oxygen is the byproduct of that water oxidation. So water gives up electrons, and then oxygen is produced. So it, it's really kind of running in reverse. Um, you can sort of think of that as, okay, right? So uh, in, in us, oxygen is being converted to water, and in plants or, or photosynthetic organisms, water is, is being converted to oxygen. So this brings up the term um, when, when we discuss oxidative phosphorylation in, in the electron transport chain, um, cellular respiration. It brings up this term chemiosmotic theory. Okay. The conversion of ADP plus an inorganic phosphate to go to ATP, that is highly unfavorable. Okay but we need that to happen to generate ATP. Okay, so how do, how do cells make this possible? Right. The phosphorylation of ADP is not a result of a, a direct reaction between ADP and some high energy phosphate carrier like we saw in, for instance, in glycolysis, right? It's not a, a substrate level phosphorylation. Okay. Um, so you, you really need a, a way to make this reaction up here possible. Okay, the energy needed to phosphorylate ADP is provided by the flow of protons down an electrochemical gradient. Okay, so that's where this um, the term uh, chemiosmotic comes into play, right? Because you ha you're you're setting up a proton gradient and that proton gradient, um, you can think of it as causing uh, an osmotic pressure, right? There's more protons on one side of a membrane than the other, okay? And the, the flow of those protons down that electrochemical gradient is, is what um, the, the energy that's going to be ultimately used to, to produce ATP from ADP, right? How do we set up that proton gradient? Well, the energy released by electron transport is used to transport protons against their gradient. Okay. Right. To do this, um, this proton transfer and energy couple, coupling, it, it requires membranes. Okay, there, There'd be no other way to do this if, if there wasn't. Um, a membrane suitable for doing this. Okay. All right. So it's the membranes requirements for the membranes to do this is, is that they need to be pretty um, impermeable. 
okay they, they can't be um leaky right you have to have a, a definite separation of protons okay and remember a proton is a you know it, it's about as small as you can get um chemically right it's just one proton with a positive charge so you have to have a membrane that can can create a um, barrier to protons and, and because they're charged right membranes uh We'll, we'll typically do a, a good job of this, assuming they don't have any um, channels that the, the protons can, can leak through. Okay. So certain membranes that, that can, can do this, um, plasma membranes and bacteria, um, the inner membrane in the mitochondria, and also the, what's, what's known as the thalkaloid membrane and chloroplasts can all, can all do this. They're, they can all establish proton gradients. The membrane must also contain proteins that couple the downhill flow of electrons in the electron transfer chain with the uphill flow of protons across the membrane. So what that means, they need proteins that can transfer electrons downhill in energy uh, and use that energy to push protons across the membrane to, in a sense, pump the protons. And then membranes must also contain a protein that couples the downhill flow of protons after that gradient has been established. Uh, they need a protein that can let the protons back in uh, and couple that downhill flow of protons with the phosphorylation of ADP. And specifically, if we look at, at these um, in some detail, this is how the, the process happens, okay? We have complexes one, two, three, and four are the, the complexes that transfer electrons, okay? And we'll, the, this is a, a rather detailed um, figure, except for complex one, of course. Um, we'll see many other, many other um, figures depicting this so do, you don't need to get it all from this uh, figure but just in brief we have the the four complexes that transfer electrons and then complex five is, is the one that's making ATP okay so we have protons being pumped outside of the membrane by complexes one three and four um, complex two does not pump protons okay complexes one and two donate electrons that they get from their reduced fuels uh, to a, a molecule known as ubiquinone. Ubiquinone transfers those electrons to complex three. Complex three then transfers the electrons to a molecule known as cytochrome C, which is uh, actually in the, the inner membrane space. Okay, this is the matrix side. This is the uh, inner membrane space side. A cytochrome C will transfer electrons from complex three to complex four. And complex four is the um, complex that will hit the ultimate electron acceptor, which is oxygen, and convert it to water. Okay, Those all pump protons. The protons then um, will be fed back through complex five, which uses that flow of protons to generate ATP. Okay, So that's... Um, oxidative phosphorylation or, or chemiosmotic theory in a nutshell. Uh, this all occurs in the mitochondrion, and the if it, it might be helpful just to remind ourselves what they look like. Okay, they have two membranes: an outer membrane and an inner membrane. Okay, the outer membrane is relatively porous; it has fairly large um, holes in it, known as, as porin channels. Okay, and that's to get metabolites uh, in and out uh, pretty pretty freely. Okay, the inner membrane. Well, okay. So first, let's let's go in order. The in, inner membrane space is the area that's between the two membranes. Okay, that environment, because the outer membrane is so porous, that environment of the inner membrane space is similar to the cytosol. Okay. But there is a higher proton concentration in there um, 
specifically close to the inner membrane um, because we have this process going on. Okay, so it, it, you can think of that as, as having a, a lower pH. Okay. Then you have an inner membrane, which is really pretty impermeable, and that's what has the proton gradient across it. Okay. The inner membrane, um, really, uh, you need, unless you're a, a small, rather uh, nonpolar molecule like oxygen, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, um, something like that, you really need a, a specific transporter to get across that membrane. Okay, so that membrane is very good at establishing a, a proton gradient across it. Okay. Um, the inner membrane is where the electron transport complexes are, and it's also where complex 5 that synthesizes ATP is. The matrix is the location, and, and the matrix is what's inside the inner membrane. Okay? And that's the location of the citric acid cycle, um, parts of lipid and amino acid metabolism. Okay? And it has a lower uh, proton concentration, which means a higher pH, okay? as compared to the outside, uh, or I should say, in, inner membrane space. Okay? It... Um, Protons are being pumped out of it, actively pumped out. So that means you're going to have a, a slightly higher pH on that in the matrix. Okay. And, and this figure here kind of just goes through that, um, summarizes. I like it because it shows you, you know, things we've been talking about in metabolism, where are they located? Well, pyruvate dehydrogenase, citric acid cycle enzymes, um, something we don't talk about in this class, but uh, fatty acid beta oxidation also occurs, occurs in there, and, and amino acid oxidation. So much of metabolism occurs in there. Okay, you also have some mitochondrial DNA um, and ribosomes, which I think are these, um, these kind of reddish dots here. Okay. So the electron transport chain, before we talk about the actual complexes in, in some detail, we'll talk about the electron carriers. Okay, So these el the electrons that are being transported, they're never just kind of freely flowing by themselves. They're being transferred from one um, you know, cofactor to an another. Okay. And so what are some of the cofactors? Well, we, we've already seen um, some of these. Okay, so there there are flavin cofactors that are that these complexes use, and those again, like we've seen with FAD, they have the same really functional part to them. This head group is where the electron um, electrons are are carried. Okay, um, we've we've seen FAD in succinate dehydrogenase. But there's also the flavin mononucleotide, FMN, or flavin adenine dinucleotide, which we've, we've already seen, FAD. Okay. Both of them um, have this same, same flavin head group. Okay. These are the initial electron acceptors for complex 1 and complex 2. Right? So complex 1 is FMN, um, complex 2 has that FAD, right? we, and we've seen complex 2 in the citric acid cycle. They can carry two electrons and, and transfer one at a time. Okay. You also have cytochromes. Okay, cytochromes um, have what are known as hemes. Uh, heme is an iron, and we've seen heme before in, in hemoglobin. But what you have is a, an iron um, metal atom in the center of a, a porphyrin ring. Okay, so you, and you can have different types of, of hemes, right? A, B, and C type hemes, and we'll talk a little bit about their differences. Okay, um, they're really all, all the same in that they have iron in the in the center, and that that iron is what's accepting the electrons. Uh, and then also we have iron sulfur clusters. In iron sulfur clusters, you can have um, a couple different types, but what you have is um, clusters of iron and sulfur atoms 
you know, usually coordinated by um, uh, amino acids. Uh, and you can have, you know, typically sulfurs because sulfurs have that, uh, excuse me, cysteines because cysteines have sulfurs on their side chain, which can be part of the iron sulfur cluster. And then also in, in this, this uh, risk center, um, histidines are coordinating on one side. Right, so uh, flavin, the, the flavin cofactors uh, in the oxidized version, they look like this. And I will draw your attention to this part um, between nitrogens 1 and 5. Okay, that's the oxidized version. You have these two double bonds that are sort of in a trans configuration. Right. When you get uh, an electron um, in... Now it's a little bit different because in this figure, the okay, we'll we'll draw your attention back here. This is nitrogen one and this is five, so it's just kind of flipped around. But you still have the double bonds in a trans configuration. Okay, the donation of one electron to this creates a um, a free radical, right? You have one electron now, so that's shown as a dot. Okay. And so you, you've lost one of the double bonds. Okay, so one electron and, and one um, hydrogen come in. Uh, the hydrogen will be on nitrogen five, and you have uh, a dot here for that, that lone electron. Okay, so you've lost one of the double bonds. So that's how you know that this is in a reduced state. And this is called a semiquinone. We'll see that term again. When we, when we look um, at the, the ubiquinone cofactor. Okay. Flavins can, have, can actually accept another um, electron uh, and another hydrogen. Okay. And when they do, it loses this double bond. Okay. So now that goes away. The, that nitrogen gets a hydrogen. And now that other electron that's come in it pairs with this unpaired electron, and now you have uh, the fully reduced, um, fully reduced form of of the flavin cofactor. Okay. Cytochromes are one electron carriers. Okay, so the iron in the the porphyrin ring um, it can carry one electron. Okay, how these differ, um, the A, B, and C. Um, are shown here and you know there there's slight differences okay um probably not super important that you know them but um he the c type heme is coordinated through um cysteine residues uh, in a in a enzyme okay um heme a has this long sort of isoprene tail here um Right, that's it, its main difference. And then B-type cytochromes have these um, uh, ethene groups um, on their on their corners, okay, which which are used to kind of coordinate. Okay, um, the the real um, difference where you see these, uh, it's you know. We'll, we'll see examples of them um, and why why are there differences well the differences of the porphyrin ring actually act, act to tune these cofactors so they have uh, different reduction potentials okay so you know you you add these um, slightly different um, constituents to the porphyrin ring and it it adjust the reduction potential of the iron right so you want the reduction potentials to be in step so that electrons can sequentially jump from one cofactor to another in a downhill energy uh, fashion okay so that's that's why these the cofactors are um, uh, tuned and and they all have like slight differences to them uh, in their their local environments and that's that's why because they're tuned so that electrons can can jump from one to the next in a in a sequence 
in a particular direction. Okay. Um, cytochrome, um, the cytochromes, when they are oxidized, give off this blue um, UV vis absorption spectrum. And when they're reduced, uh, it changes slightly. Uh, and, and you get the addition of this, uh, the alpha and beta um, peaks in the, in the spectrum. And the, the large ones uh, often referred to as the soray band. And then you have bands out here that um, these bands are, I believe, referred to as, as Q bands. Okay. Uh, iron sulfur clusters, uh, like cytochromes, are one electron carriers. Okay. They're coordinated by cysteines uh, in the protein. Um, also some histidines in, in complex three, as we'll see. Um, they contain equal numbers of iron and sulfur atoms. Okay. Um, so in this um, cluster here, we have a two iron, two sulfur, um, and here's a, a four iron, four sulfur cluster. Um, the one iron sulfur cluster, um, right, that obviously doesn't contain equal number of, of sulfur um, atoms because, right, there really aren't any lone sulfur atoms. They're just the sulfurs from the cysteines, okay? Um, you see the, the two iron, two sulfur, and four iron, four sulfur clusters much more frequently. I, I will say, okay. Uh, and then there is that, that different center, uh, the risk center of complex three, and that's where you have um, histidines on, coordinating one side instead of cysteines. Okay. And again, that is the reason that happens uh, is to tune that iron sulfur cluster um, to to be at a certain reduction potential so that electron transfer can happen in that, in that one direction, okay? Um, and I'll mention this again, but, you know, these, these complexes are using the same basic cofactors as one another, especially when we look at complex one, right? There are lots of iron sulfur clusters. How do you get the electrons to transfer in a, a certain direction, right? Um, you have to tune the 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 elect the iron sulfur clusters to have, you know, a downhill flow of their electron potentials, their reduction potentials. Okay. So ultimately, um, complex one and two will use iron sulfur clusters, um, flavins. Uh, to and hemes to to transfer electrons and they're transferring the electrons to a molecule known as ubiquinone also referred to as coenzyme q or simply abbreviated as q okay ubiquinone is lipid soluble so it it's it's flowing around in the inner membrane okay and it can accept electrons Okay, it can accept two electrons and also picking up two protons uh, to make uh, an alcohol known as ubiquinol. So ubiquinone has, has um, carbonyl groups. Ubiquinol that's been reduced has alcohol groups. And that's how uh, easy way to, to tell the difference between the two. Okay, ubiquinol freely diffuses through the membranes and carries the electrons um, from one side of the membrane um, to the other side, um, which, which we'll see. Um, really, it, it, I don't like that, that term, it, it really carries them through the membrane to a, another complex. Okay. Um, coenzyme Q is the complex that it transfers electrons from complexes one and two to complex three. And so uh, looking at a, a better picture of it, okay, it has this long hydrophobic tail on it, which is what makes it membrane soluble, okay? And you might have heard coenzyme Q10, and that refers to the fact that it has 10 of these repeats, okay? Um, so that's where that, that 10 comes from. 
the electron transport occurs in this part of the molecule, the head group. Okay, so the oxidized form has these two uh, carbonyl groups, these ketones. Okay. This can do uh, transfer two electrons or accept two electrons, but it can do it one at a time. So if we, we accept one electron and one proton, what does that look like? Well, now we have, um, you, you lose the, the ketone down here and form one alcohol. The other oxygen, uh, you, you lose that double bond and then you, you get that dot. That's, that dots the unpaired electron. Okay, so this is uh, technically a free radical again, like the, the one electron reduced flavin. Okay. Um, and, and we refer to this again as a semiquinone radical. Right, so this, the oxidized form we abbreviate as Q. Um, the semiquinone can be abbreviated as QH dot. Okay, that tells you that there's an unpaired electron. Okay, that, again, that's called a semiquinone. Uh, and then finally, you do another electron, another proton, and you get the two alcohol groups. This is fully reduced ubiquinol, and that is abbreviated as QH2. Okay, the free energy, we'll talk a little bit about this free energy um, uh, of electron transport. Okay. The reduction potential, if you remember that from, from gem chem or maybe physics, um, reduction potentials, uh, how, you, how you can, can measure the, um, the change in energy from uh, an electron transfer you take the reduction potential of the electron acceptor, okay, so this the second part in the step, you know, where the electron goes, it, um, ultimately ends up, minus the reduction potential of what is giving off the electron, the donor, okay? So it, it's, you know, final minus initial, in a sense, of, of reduction potentials, and that gives you the, the change in energy, or the, the delta E, um, change in reduction potential. And you can calculate a delta G based on that using this equation, which is equal to negative N, which is the number of electrons being transferred, times F Faraday's constant, uh, times that, that change in reduction potential. Okay, so remember, right, it, for something to be spontaneous, you need delta G to be negative. And to, for that to happen using this equation, what that means is your delta E, your change in reduction potential, has to be positive. And looking at it in a little bit more detail using the equation above, what that means for delta E to be positive is the reduction potential of the acceptor has to be higher than the reduction potential of the donor. Okay, so electrons are transferred from a lower or more negative um, cofactor to um, one that is higher or more positive in reduction potential. Okay, so, so in a sense, a downhill flow of energy for electrons w w is sort of like a, an uphill in their reduction potentials. Okay. okay, the free energy that's released in these, due to these transfers, right, you can measure that with the delta G, that's the free energy that's used to pump protons and it stores that free energy in, in, the, tr in the form of an electrochemical gradient. Okay. Here's a, a list of some reduction potentials of, of some cofactors involved, right? So you, we're going from, from more negative or lower to higher values, and you can see that the, the cofactor uh, NAD plus to get reduced has, has a pretty low reduction potential, right? That's one of the first things that, that we use to accept electrons in metabolism, okay? And then um, this NADH dehydrogenase flavin mononucleotide in, in complex one um, has, you know, a slightly higher reduction potential. Uh, ubiquinone, again, higher. The cytochromes, are you know constantly getting higher and higher, and then finally the ultimate electron acceptor oxygen has the highest reduction potential, right? So the flow of electrons is going from 
uh, lower numbers to higher numbers. Yeah, and th this is just another way to, to show that um, in a figure form. The electrons flow downhill. Um, that's downhill in energy, but remember that would be um, uphill in reduction potentials, right? So we, um, the first one that we really use to transfer electrons would be the, the NAD, NADH, okay? Then we go through the FMN in complex one, okay? So the reduced NADH will react with an oxidized FMN to reduce it, it becomes NAD, become, NADH becomes NAD again, right? So you get the reduced and oxidized things switching places. Now this is oxidized, that's reduced. Okay, that, that sort of transfer keeps happening. Okay. Um, the flavin mononucleotide then goes and, and reduces uh, iron sulfur clusters, um, then to coenzyme Q. Okay, coenzyme Q transfers the electrons to um, complex three, which uses a series of, of cytochromes. The cytochromes right, transfer electrons to each other, ultimately to um, complex uh, four, which then transfers electrons to oxygen. Okay. So these, these cofactors, right, you couldn't just use, um, you know, a bunch, a series of, of flavin cofactors probably, right, because they'd be too similar in reduction potentials. So that's why you have to use, you know, um, flavin, iron sulfur clusters, coenzyme Q, and, and cytochromes because the reduction potentials of each are, are getting slightly higher. Okay. All right, now let's look at the, the individual complexes. Um, this is really the, uh, an overview, okay, um, showing very little detail. Okay, complex one um, is known as NADH dehydrogenase. Okay, that name tells you what it's doing. Okay, it's, a, it's involved in oxidation reduction reaction uh, and its substrate is NADH. Okay. Um, complex two is a little bit difficult, right? Because its name is succinate dehydrogenase. Okay, and, and we think of in terms of electron transfer in, in this process, it's, it's um, taking electrons from FADH2 um, and that's where it's getting its electrons. But remember the difference NADH, uh, that's a mobile cofactor that moves from one, one protein to another. So this is, can be freely flowing around. The FAD cofactors are built into proteins. So these are actually inside complex two and, and don't, don't get released. So the substrate of complex two is actually succinate. And we've seen this before, again, I'm gonna keep mentioning this, but we, we've seen this before. That was succinate dehydrogenase from the citric acid cycle, okay? So the, the FADH2 that's made in the citric acid cycle um, is not flowing around. It's actually in this complex, okay? Uh, and I should be mentioning too the, the number of subunits for each of these. So complex one, is the largest complex. It has 47 subunits. That's, you know, massive in, in terms. So there's 47 individual proteins that go together to build complex one. Um, seven of them are actually encoded by mitochondrial DNA uh, and 40 of them by nuclear DNA. And that's another fascinating kind of aside um, thing that, um, is interesting um, kind of the um, symbiotic theory there that at some point in time, you know, cells engulfed um, smaller cells and they ended up becoming mitochondria inside the cells. And the host cells incorporated a lot of the, the, a lot of the DNA from these um, smaller bacterial Pro, I should say prokaryotic cells that they engulfed, okay, and encoded their that DNA became the host cell nuclear DNA, right? So there's 
something like a thousand proteins that need to go in a mitochondria, most of those, um, all but 13 of those proteins are encoded by the nuclear DNA, and only 13 um, protein subunits are encoded by, by mitochondrial DNA. Okay, So a uh, majority of the mitochondrial DNA that encodes for proteins um, actually go to make up parts of complex one. A succinate dehydrogenase uh, is all nuclear DNA, and it's only four subunits, so this is one of the smaller complexes. Complex 3 has 11 subunits. Um, its name is ubiquinol cytochrome C oxidoreductase, which is a mouthful, but you know it, it's, it's sort of telling you what's happening. Ubiquinol, the reduced ubiquinone, is its substrate, and cytochrome C is it's another substrate, so it, it, it's, it's, re, it's catalyzing an oxidation reduction reaction between ubiquinol and cytochrome C. So the electrons are coming from ubiquinol and going to cytochrome C. Okay. okay, 11 subunits. It has one of those subunits encoded by mitochondrial DNA. The other 10 are nuclear. Complex 4 okay, is called cytochrome C oxidase. That's telling you what's, what's going on. Cytochrome C is the reduced cofactor, and it's oxidizing it okay, um, and ultimately transferring the electrons to oxygen. Okay. 13 subunits, uh, 3 are mitochondrial, 10 are, 10 are nuclear DNA. Okay. This table shows you the masses of these, and, and you can see in kilodaltons, the um, complex 1 is, is the largest, um, 850 um, kilodaltons. The, the number of subunits here is, is sort of differing, um, which, you know, depending on where you look, um, this might be including some regulatory uh, proteins, and this isn't. Uh, I'm not really sure what, what the difference is due to. Okay. Um, um, what other things are important? Well, the prosthetic groups are probably important to note, too. Right? Complex 1 uses the FMN initially, then iron sulfur clusters. Complex 2 uses FAD. Uh, then iron sulfur clusters, so those are similar, right? Flavins, then iron sulfurs. Complex three uses hemes, and then the the risk iron sulfur center. Cytochrome C uses a heme. Cytochrome four uses hemes, and then finally copper, um, the copper A and copper B centers, which we'll see in detail. Okay, so. This is uh, another figure just kind of showing um, a general view of this. Again, complex one is getting electrons from NADH, shuttling them through flavin and iron sulfur clusters to ubiquinone. Uh, complex two is suck getting um, from the citric acid cycle succinate, that's where the electrons come from. They come, go through FAD, then iron sulfur clusters, then um, again to ubiquinone. That transfers, um, it, this kind of builds up what's known as the ubiquinone pool. Okay, some other things that, that donate electrons to ubiquinone, uh, glycerol 3 phosphate, um, the, the protein uh, glycerol 3-phosphate dehydrogenase has, a, has an FAD in it, and it's um, actually transferring electrons in it. Now, it's in the inner, inner membrane space side of this membrane, but the electrons from glycerol 3-phosphate um, will be donated to the ubiquinone pool. Okay. And then fatty acid oxidation, which we don't really discuss in, in any detail, but um, the breakdown of fatty acids occurs through um, acyl-CoA dehydrogenases, uh, many different ones, and then to a protein called electron transferring flavoprotein and ETFQO, which is electron transferring flavoprotein ubiquinone oxidoreductase. But these are all going through FAD cofactors and then an iron sulfur cluster and then to ubiquinone. 
So this is another um, important way um, ubiquinone is reduced. Then um, let's look at these uh, complex, it, the complexes in a little bit more detail. Um, complex one, also known as NADH ubiquinone oxidoreductase, yeah, that's telling you it, it's transferring electrons from NADH to ubiquinone. Okay. It, it's one of the biggest macromolecular assemblies in, in mammalian cells. Okay. There's over 40 different proteins involved in it. Okay. Um, the NADH binding site is in the matrix. A non-covalently bound uh, FMN accepts two electrons from NADH. And then there's several iron sulfur clusters that pass one electron at a time towards the ubiquinone binding site. Okay, so if we look uh, at this picture, right, our 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 NADH binding site, it would be somewhere around here. We would have two electrons being transferred to the flavin mononucleotide, and then one electron at a time can be transferred through iron sulfur clusters. Okay. And there's, you know, several iron sulfur clusters that aren't necessarily in um, this line that goes towards ubiquinone, and at least it's thought that these can can act to kind of accept one electron and, and, and bounce an electron um, so that the, right, because each of these can only accept one electron at a time. So in that way, you can have one kind of bouncing around um, ready to, to follow uh, its partner towards ubiquinone. Because what you don't want to have is only one electron going through this and, and make the semiquinone or free radical version of ubiquinone. Okay. There's an error here um, in the figure. I just wanted to point that out. The, the arrow should be going the other way, right? NADH should be going to um, um, NAD+. Plus. Right, this is reduced, that's oxidized. You're not gonna get any electrons out of NAD+. Plus. The process of doing this, you are taking two protons from the matrix side and putting them on ubiquinone when it's getting reduced. So that's taking protons out. You're also pumping four other protons out into the inner membrane space. So um, the matrix side are also known as the N side. Um, you're pumping protons from that side to the inner membrane space or the P side. Okay. This is a, a, a crystal structure of this complex and it shows uh, these um, iron sulfur clusters and, and where they're positioned with each other. Um, not important that you know this. I just show this to show you um, a, maybe a more realistic picture of how, how this looks, this complex complex looks. And it, it is really, really big, and it has lots of uh, complexes with it. And you'll see here, um, there's really nowhere close to 40 uh, proteins. The, they're all kind of shown in different colors, right? So this is, you know, only kind of a partial view of it. Okay. Another you know, kind of view of this. This one here shows your NADH binding site. Okay, and this this shows uh, in a little bit more detail the the orientation of these iron sulfur clusters together. And you see that some are four iron, four sulfur clusters, and there's others that are two iron, two sulfur clusters. Okay, uh, and and where the the flavin mononucleotide goes. So. In a sense, you, you have um, one electron can be donated into what I would say is like the main um, pathway, okay? And another one can kind of go into this other um, holding iron sulfur cluster and, and sort of wait, okay? And you know that the, the, because the, the distances between them, you know, this distance here is, is probably... Um, you know, slightly long to, to do a direct transfer, so it, it can kind of bounce back and forth. 
between the the fmn and the and this center before it can you know get a free the the free n3 cluster to to transfer through NADH ubiquinone oxidoreductase, or complex one, is a proton pump, okay? And again, it, it's transferring protons from the matrix side to the inner membrane space side, okay? Experiments suggest that about four protons are transported per one NADH. So that's the number we'll go with. Um, so the reaction it, it, it catalyzes here is NADH plus ubiquinone plus um, five protons, right? We'll go to NAD plus plus QH2 plus four protons uh, on the P side, okay? And, and so the, the number of H's here on both sides is six. They, they add up to six. Okay. So that, that's a, a balanced equation for what's going on here, okay? Um, protons are transported by what, what are known as proton wires. Um, this is a series of amino acids uh, that undergo protonation and deprotonation to get a net transfer of, of a proton from one side of the membrane to another. So if you're curious uh, as to you know, how these protons are getting through, um, the amino acid side chains that are in the protein are sort of passing those along. Okay. Moving on to complex two, and this is known as succinate dehydrogenase. Again, this is from the citric acid cycle. The, the reaction of succinate to fumarate is catalyzed by this complex. Okay. And this has a FAD, which accepts two electrons from succinate. Okay, electrons are passed one at a time via iron sulfur clusters to ubiquinone, just as in uh, complex one. Um, the, however, complex two does not transport transport protein protons. Okay, so this is a, a, a much simpler looking molecule. Okay, you have uh, four subunits A, B, C, and D. Okay, you have a, a succinate binding site that's somewhere you know in the A and B subunit interface. It'll transfer to your FAD, which is in, in um, subunit A. Then it transfers to iron sulfur clusters, right? First a two iron, two sulfur, then four iron, four sulfur clusters um, that are located in, in B, um, the B complex, okay? And then the ubiquinone binding site is, is located in the membrane where the C and D subunits are. And you also have a heme um, B cofactor in, in complex two. Okay, so the heme is not really, in complex two, this heme is not really used for transferring electrons. Um, it's thought that it's used to sort of prevent reactive oxygen species, you know, um, you have you you have this problem that the NADH and FADs um, they they can accept two electrons, but iron sulfur clusters can only transfer, and and ubiquinone can also accept two electrons, but iron sulfur clusters can only transfer one electron at a time. So you have the potential to just transfer one electron to ubiquinone, which would 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 make a a free radical which can make uh, ultimately go to make reactive oxygen species. Okay. So the heme is sort of a, a way to prevent that. Um, this is a, a more you know kind of cartoony figure uh, of complex two but I think it shows probably a better job of this. Okay the the A subunit is where your FAD cofactor is. Then you have three iron sulfur um, subunits which you can think of as being in, in on the B subunit and the C and D subunits are where ubiquinone binds okay right. okay complex three the reduced ubiquinone that that is made in complex one and complex two 
is then uh, goes on and, and transfers its electrons to complex three. Okay, the other names for complex three are ubiquinone cytochrome C oxidoreductase, which I kind of like the best. It more, it's most descriptive, I guess. Um, you can also here sometimes see it referred to as coenzyme Q cytochrome C reductase. Um, you know, very similar uh, name. Coenzyme Q is the same as ubiquinone. Um, and, and then finally, it, it's also referred to as the cytochrome BC1 complex, which is probably the least descriptive name, okay? Um, I think this is probably the first name it, it got, though, because it, it really tells you that that complex is, is containing cytochromes, um, but it doesn't really tell you what it's doing. Okay. This complex uses two electrons from ubiquinone to reduce two molecules of cytochrome C. Okay. So cytochrome C is a protein that has a, a um, cytochrome in it, a heme group, uh, and those take one electron. So you need two molecules of cytochrome C. Okay. Um, complex three contains three redox active subunits. Okay. Those are called cytochrome B, cytochrome C1, and the RISC protein. Okay. So cytochrome B has a B-type heme, um, cytochrome C1 has a C-type heme, and the RISC protein has the RISC iron sulfur cluster. Okay. Um, something, uh, it's not entirely straightforward here, but um, something known as the Q cycle results in four additional protons being transported into the inner membrane space. Okay, so we'll, we'll look at the, the um, Q cycle when we, when we talk about complex three. Okay. Um, this complex is made up of a dimer of two identical 11 subunit assemblies. Each 11 subunit assemblies has those three respiratory subunits. Cytochrome B, cytochrome C1, and the RISC protein. Okay. Um, so it, it, it's, it can look a little bit uh, complex. Okay. Um, the cytochrome B uh, it have actually two heme groups. They have um, the heme BH and heme BL. And you can think of the H and L standing for maybe high potential and low potential. Um, the RISC protein um, is here with the, the RISC iron sulfur cluster. And then cytochrome C1 is, is also kind of on the inner membrane side with the, the heme C um, gr prosthetic group. And right, and it, it is a dimer, so you, you have... Um, two of these subunits so so double the the um, electron transfer um, um, cofactors okay so the q cycle is what leads to the the proton pumping ability of complex three okay experimentally four protons are transported across the membrane per two electrons that reach cytochrome C. Two of the four protons come from the reduced ubiquinone. Okay. The Q cycle provides a good model that explains how two additional protons are picked up from the matrix and transferred. Um, two molecules of ubiquinol become oxidized, releasing protons into the inner membrane space. Okay, one molecule uh, of ubiquinone becomes reduced, uh, thus a net transfer of four protons per reduced coenzyme Q. And so in words, it's probably a little confusing, but we'll look at it in terms uh, of a figure. It might make a little bit more sense. Okay, so uh, if we look here as our initial starting point, Okay, you have a molecule of reduced ubiquinol coming in. Okay, it has two electrons, but only one electron can go 
into the reef center and then ultimately to cytochrome C1 and, and then to cytochrome C. Okay, so that's one electron. It needs to, to get rid of another electron. <clears throat> so it can, it can, the other electron can go through those um, cytochrome BH, uh, BL and BH and be put back on an oxidized molecule of, of ubiquinone to make uh, the semiquinone form, okay? So when this happens, right, the reduced ubiquinol, when it, when it transfers those electrons, one in each direction, it will give up two protons that it, that it picked up on the end side, and, and those protons are, are kind of transferred onto the, the inner membrane space side. Okay, so that's two of the protons. Okay, then uh, another ub reduced ubiquinone can come in and, and do sort of the same thing, right? And when you have um, a the semiquinone form of of ubiquin uh, ubiquinone in, in this site again, that one electron coming in will then fully reduce that to ubiquinol. It, it picks up another two uh, protons from the, the end side, okay? So it's, you know, the, the half reactions are shown here. The net equation for the Q cycle or for um, complex three is shown here. You have one reduced uh, ubiquinone plus two cytochrome C1 oxidized plus two protons from the end side go to Q um, plus two cytochrome C1s reduced plus four protons on the P side, right? So you might be kind of confused. You're like, well, we, we used two, two reduced ubiquinones or ubiquinols, right? Or we're getting rid of two of them. But in the process of that, you're actually making one of them too, right? So you use two, but you make one. Okay, so the net is that you're, you're only um, using one. Okay, some other ways, uh, there's some other figures here that might be easier for you to, to see this Q cycle um, that are, you know, show a little bit less detail, which might, which probably does make that it, it is easier to, to see, which are here. Um, so you can look through these uh, if it helps. Okay, ultimately, you know, the electrons will go to the risk center, then um, cytochrome C1, the subunit cytochrome C1 uh, and its heme group. And then they're transferred um, one at a time to two molecules of, of cytochrome C. Okay. Cytochrome C is the second mobile electron carrier, right? The first one was ubiquinone, okay? It's a soluble, protein um, containing a heme group. Uh, it's located in the inner membrane space. Okay, heme iron um, can be in either the ferrous, which is iron three plus, which is the oxidized form, or the ferric or Fe two plus, which is the reduced form. Okay, cytochrome C carries a single electron from the cytochrome BC1 complex, complex three, to cytochrome oxidase, which is complex four. Okay, so cytochrome C is moving electrons from complex three to complex four. Okay, and this is, the nomenclature can be a little bit tricky, right? Because cytochrome C1 is a membrane protein. It's a subunit that's located in complex three. Cytochrome C is a soluble protein that goes from complex three to complex four. Again, cytochrome C can absorb visible light, um, and we've seen the, the heme group, um, that spectrum again. Um, that SORA band it absorbs blue light, so cytochrome C gives a very intense red or pinkish color. Um, if you've ever worked with cytochrome C, the protein, it, it, it's, it's a very red or, or pink, very bright color yeah, because of that. Okay. 
Um, cytochrome seams are named by their position of their, their longest wavelength alpha peak. So um, just kind of an, an information F, FYI there. Okay. Moving on to complex four. Okay, complex four is known as cytochrome C oxidase. It's oxidizing cytochrome C. Okay, so reduced cytochrome C comes in and the complex four will oxidize it. Okay. Okay. Cytochrome C oxidase complex four contains two heme groups, uh, heme A and heme A3. Okay, it also contains uh, copper ions, copper A, which is uh, um, two ions that accept electrons from cytochrome C, and then copper B, um, which are bonded to heme A3, forming a, a binuclear center that transfers four electrons to oxygen. Okay, so we can see this in, in a picture a little bit better. Okay, so we have our, our copper um, center here, shown here, uh, coordinated by uh, cysteine residues, um, as well as uh, methionine and histidine uh, on the top and bottom of it. Okay, and then you have our heme A and heme A3 groups are sort of um, facing each other, uh, and they're more buried in the membrane. So four electrons are used to reduce one oxygen molecule into two water molecules, right? You have oxygen, O2, okay, so you're going to make two H2Os, okay? So you need, for that, you need four electrons. Four protons are picked up from the matrix uh, in this process, okay? Four additional protons are passed from the matrix to the inner membrane space. So it's using four protons to make water, and then it's it's pumping four additional protons into the inner membrane space. Right, so how does this happen? Uh, just uh, more of a cartoon flow diagram of this. Okay, cytochrome C comes in reduced. It transfers one electron. Each cytochrome C will transfer one electron to the copper A subunit. Okay, that's the initial electron acceptor in complex four. Okay, and that that that's in what's known as subunit two. Okay, uh, that electron will then go that they flow into the heme A, um, the heme A group, uh, and the heme A three group, uh, and then the heme A three group is is the one that's sort of um, in complex with copper uh, B, the copper B center, uh, and this sort of is referred to as a iron copper center uh, in total okay and so this position between copper b and heme a3 is where oxygen will come in oxygen then accepts the the electrons and then it's converted into water okay and so the stoichiometry of this is you need four electrons so you need four cytochrome c's to transfer those electrons to one molecule of O2 to make two H2Os. Okay, by doing that, you grab four protons uh, as substrate protons to make H2O, and then four other protons are being pumped from the matrix to the inner membrane space. Okay, so in summary, okay, for the, the electron transport chain, we have Electrons from NADH going through complex one through iron sulfur clusters to ubiquinone. Complex two accepts electrons from succinate um, through the flavin, then through its um, iron sulfur clusters to ubiquinone. Okay, ubiquinone transfers them from complex one and complex two to complex three. Okay, complex three um, has those. Um, cytochrome C1 uh, it has the reef center and then cytochrome C1 um, which then transfers electrons to cytochrome C it also has the cytochrome uh, BL and BH groups 
um, that are used in the Q cycle. Okay, the overall process of the Q cycle is that you are pumping four protons out for every ubiquinol that's that that transfers electrons. Okay, cytochrome C, two molecules of cytochrome C um, per ubiquinol will then go to complex four. Okay, complex four needs four cytochrome Cs to, to transfer. Well, the stoichiometry here is two cytochrome Cs will transfer two electrons to a half mole of O2 to make H2O, to make one H2O, okay? And by doing that, it pumps two protons. So I would say, watch, if, if you're asked to count protons being pumped or something like that, um, watch the stoichiometry um, of complex four. Is it in terms of a half O2 or, or one O2? Okay. okay. So it's, uh, another way to summarize this, right? Complex one to complex four. Um, you have one molecule of NADH will, will go to make 11. Uh, we'll, excuse me, we'll add with 11 protons from the N side, the matrix side and react with a half uh, molecule of O2 to produce 10 protons on the inner membrane space side and one water molecule, okay? If we're starting from complex two, we have FADH2 and six matrix protons. We'll go to produce six inner membrane space protons and water, okay? So the difference in number of protons transported is going to reflect a difference in the amount of ATP that can be synthesized. Okay. Right. So the proton motive force is um, what's being generated by these complexes. So these complexes in this electron transport chain are creating an electrochemical proton gradient. They're either actively transporting protons across the membrane, which is done in complex one and complex four. They're chemically removing protons from the matrix um, by the reduction you know, of, of ubiquinone or the reduction of oxygen. So those are complexes one, three, and four. Or they're releasing protons into the inner membrane space side. Um, so the oxidation of uh, of QH2 in, in complex three, it would be releasing protons into the inner membrane space. Okay, so we're, by pumping these protons from the, the matrix side to the inner membrane space side, we're creating this gradient. And this figure is just showing kind of, you know, generic proton pump, removing protons from the matrix side or N side to the inner membrane space or P side. Okay, so we're, we're creating this gradient. And, you know, the, the delta G um, for this process can be given by this equation where you have um, uh, the change in concentration on, on each one side of the membrane to the other, um, plus um, the um, Faraday constant and, and uh, membrane potential, right? And so you can re reduce this a little bit into to um, because we're talking about protons, and, and, and talk about a change in pH uh, on each side of the membrane, and then you know the the membrane potential piece to it as well. Okay, so you have the um, factors from the chemical part of it, which would be um, dealing with the pH difference and, and the um, uh, electrical part of it, the membrane potential. Right. So electron transport is ultimately Right, we, we think of it, okay, those electrons go to oxygen and make water, right? The whole reason that they're being transferred though is to set up this proton gradient, right? And the energy of this 
proton gradient or proton motive force is what drives the synthesis of ATP. Okay. So it, we can, uh, another way to put that is that ATP synthesis is coupled to electron transport. And if you cut off one, you're going to stop the other. Okay. And that's what are shown here. So if you if you do um, a experiment where you're monitoring monitoring the amount of oxygen consumed, okay, with a, a given time, um, if when you add um, the substrates uh, ADP and PI, you see that more oxygen is going to be consumed. You add succinate, and, and that gives you you know uh, an electron uh, donator. Right, that you can see a lot of oxygen is consumed after that point. When you have um, the substrates ADP and in, inorganic in phosphate and an electron donator, you're going to start consuming lots of oxygen. Then you add cyanide, which is an inhibitor of electron transport, um, complex four uh, inhibitor, strong inhibitor, um, cuts off electron transport, and you see that. It flatlines. No more oxygen is consumed, right? You've cut off electron transport, therefore you, you stop the con consumption of, of oxygen. And you also, when we're looking at the synthesis of ATP, you stop the synthesis of ATP, right? So you don't generate ATP when you have <clears throat> ADP and inorganic phosphate, right? No, no ATP is being generated until you add that electron um, donator. Okay, so you need both those substrates and electrons being trans transported to generate ATP. Okay. Right. And this is just a, a little bit more um, um, in detail, right? You have succinate, which is your electron donator. Uh, you add those substrates for ATP production. You can then start consuming much more oxygen, right? So oxygen goes up, your ATP synthesis goes up. Then you add these, um, um, they're really toxins, but what they do is they, they, um, they act to sort of um, block a electron transport. Um, I forget where exactly. Uh, oligomycin might be complex one inhibitor. Um, but anyway, they, they stop electron transport and you get uh, a slowing of oxygen consumption and no ATP production. Okay, then you can add something that uncouples these, these two processes where you can start consuming oxygen again, um, but when they're uncoupled, right, there are, there's still no, you can have electron transport, but you have no ATP synthesis. Okay, so these experiments are just a really uh, another way of showing that you need ATP, to, to produce ATP, you need electron transport, right? And it, which ultimately creates the proton motive force. Okay, so how we generate ATP from this is by complex five. And this is also known as ATP synthase. It contains two functional units that are, are multi-subunit complexes. Okay, the F1, is what is sticking out in the matrix, and the F0 is what's in the membrane. Okay. So the F1 is where you have the, the production of ATP occurring at. Okay. The F0 is what's transporting protons from the inner membrane space into the matrix, uh, and it's also um, what's but using that energy from that transfer to to power the F1 subunit. Okay. All right, so proton transferring um, causes a rotation in the F0 subunit. Okay, so this is um, the F0 subunit. Protons are transferred. That transferring of protons down the gradient uh, and this is, now we're looking at the inner kind of flipped up. So this is the matrix side. This is the inner membrane space side. Protons being transferred 
through that F0 subunit, uh, or it's not really a subunit, but that F0 um, component of complex 5 causes this to turn, and that, that turning motion is transferred to F1 through this gamma subunit which is, you also refer to as uh, the central shaft. Okay. This causes conformational change within all three alpha beta pairs of the F1, uh, F1 portion of complex 5, which we will talk a little bit more about. And that conformational change is one of uh, the conformational change in one of the three pairs of alpha beta um, subunits promotes the condensation of, of ADP and inorganic phosphate into ATP. Okay, so F1 is going to is made up of um, a trimer of dimers. So there's three alpha beta pairs that, that make up uh, F1. And then it, it, there's also this piece that kind of connects both the F0 and F1 together, which we probably won't really discuss too much. Okay. So the hexamer that's arranged in, in three alpha beta dimers uh, uh, is at the F1 portion, okay? The dimers can exist in three different conformations, an open or empty, a loose conformation that has ADP and PI bound, and then a tight conformation that catalyzes the formation of ATP, okay? And so, and I should also mention that you have, one, at any given time, you know, the three dimers are, you have to have one of these conformations. So one of the dimers will be open, one of the dimers will be loose, and the other one will be tight. And the way people kind of show this, this is on the crystal structure, but they show it using these different shapes um, outlining them. Okay, so the, the empty or, or open conformation is, is down here. Uh, then you have the loose conformation up here with ADP bound, and then the tight would be um, shown here with ATP. Okay. Right, so just removing the crystal structure and showing only the, the cartoon picture, which would probably be more simple to see. Okay, if we start at this point, Okay, what do we have? Well, we have, uh, and you, you can think of that, that gamma subunit that comes from the F0 portion of, of complex 5 as being sort of an arrow. And wherever the arrow points, it converts that, that dimer into the open conformation. Okay, so it's sort of, depending on that shaft it rotating, it's going to change the conformation of, of all of these, these subunits. So in that case, this alpha beta that had ATP bound is now in the, the open conformation. So ATP is released from them. Um, the next one it, it does the loose conformation where it combined ADP and, and, and phosphate. And then this, conf this dimer is in the tight conformation where ATP is formed. Okay, so this will be our starting point. Well, I guess we should follow the arrows, huh? So this will be our, if this is our starting point, we'll go this direction. Okay. The pumping of three protons will then move that, that gamma subunit, that gamma shaft. The arrow now will, will move in this direction. It'll point to this side. Okay. So what this dimer was in the tight conformation that formed ATP, it's now in the open. So ATP releases. Okay, uh, this red subunit was in, in, in the loose conformation. It's now in the tight conformation, so ATP is formed. And, and then the, the conformation that was in the open, uh, the dimer that was in the open conformation is now in the loose, so ADP and PI can now bind to that. Okay, three more protons. Again, the gamma shaft will rotate, right? The red now becomes uh, open. ATP is released, what was loose now becomes tight, ATP is formed, and what was open now becomes loose and ADP combined. 
Okay, so this, this process just continues as protons are pumped. Okay, so for every three protons pumped, what does that mean? It means every three protons that are pumped, you're, you're generating one ATP. And, and here's just kind of a, a animation of that, right? The gamma subunit shifts, it will release ATP uh, where, it, where it points at. Uh, and then AT, uh, the ADP and PI can come in and bind there again. Okay, so that's the F1 side. If we look at the F0 side, um, it's really, um, I guess you could describe it as sort of a, a rotor in a sense. Okay, and we start down here at point one. A proton will enter. Uh, the the half channel on the p side on the <clears throat> matrix side excuse me intermembrane space side okay that comes in and there's an arginine sort of um in in in, in that channel when the proton comes in it, it displaces that arginine to the adjacent c subunit okay so the the C subunits are in this um, ring, this C10 ring. There are 10 C subunits that form a ring. Okay. So arginine will move over uh, to the, the, next, the, the next C subunit, and that, that rotates, um, will displace the, the proton. Okay, so um, proton comes in, arginine 210 moves over, the arginine 210 moving over that positive charge pushes a proton out onto the the um, the matrix side, the end side. Okay. The C10 ring then rotates. It it'll rotate then, and arginine 210 will return to that that half channel uh, position, and then the the whole process can repeat. Okay. So you're using this downhill flow, um, but the, you're not just allowing those protons to blast through there. You're, you're doing it very um, orderly and sequentially, right? And, and you're using that, that clicking. It's almost like it's clicking each time, that slight click over to, to generate a, a rotational force, which is then used and, and transferred by the gamma shaft into the F1 subunit to change conformation and to catalyze the production of ATP. Okay, this motion is not a continuum. There's really three distinct conformations and that's shown here if you, the, the experiment was they had attached a, an actin filament to this, um, right? They had the C, instead of being in a membrane now, they, they have the F1 subunit um, attached to the metal, um, um, just a, a piece of metal to keep it stationary. And then the C C10 subunit was allowed to spin and they attached an actin filament, which they made, you know, fluorescent tags on it. They could watch it. And it really is, you know, three, what they saw as three distinct conformations. So keeping this complex going, you need to have, if you think of that, if it's, if it's making ATP, right, how do you keep this going? Well, you obviously need the protons to keep that, that gradient there to keep it rotating, but you also need ADP and inorganic phosphate in the matrix to keep the production of ATP going. And to do that, you have a couple transporters. You have one that trans, uh, transports your ADP into the, the matrix. Okay, so for every ADP it transports in, an ATP is transported out, okay, which kind of makes sense, right? You, you also need to get that ATP, um, you need to be able to get it out into the cytosol. Okay, so a, an ADP comes in, ATP goes out, so it's a, a, an anti-porter. 
Right? When you're doing this though, you're, you're having a negative three charged ADP come in and a negative four charged ATP go out. So that, that there's not a charge balance there. Okay. So one way to balance that charge is the, the phosphate group. Inorganic phosphate will come in um, along with your ADP. So for a negative four charge coming in and a negative four charge coming out. Okay. For every um, phosphate that comes in, you're also transporting a, a proton. Okay. And so that um, is then, this is a symporter. So this is called phosphate translocase. Okay, it's a symporter. So it, it's kind of costing you um, your, if you think of your proton grading as a currency, it, it's costing you something to transport that inorganic phosphate in. Okay. And I should mention the name of the other one, adenine nucleotide translocase. Okay. That's the one that, that is switching ADP and ATP. Okay, so let's do some bookkeeping. Okay, the ATP synthase produces one ATP for every three protons that it pumps. Okay, the translocase and um, the translocases, adenine nucleotide nuclease translocase and phosphate translocase, they consume one proton for every ATP in a sense, every ATP that's generated, right? For every um, phosphate group that's brought in and ADP that's brought in, they need to, to move one proton. Okay, so the net ratio then becomes one ATP formed for every four protons that, that are um, pumped from the inner membrane space to the matrix. Um, and another way I should say that is you, you need four protons pumped into the inner membrane space to be able to create one ATP. Okay, so for the electron transport chain, if we look at um, from complex one, from every NADH, we can make 10 protons. We can pump 10 protons out. Okay, and those are four from complex one, four from complex three, and two from complex four, right? Um, remember, this is for every one NADH, complex four makes two, okay? From FAD, from complex two, we can only pump six out, okay? So the final stoichiometry is for every one NADH, we get 10 protons. 10 protons divided by four, right? So it, make, it takes four protons to make an ATP. If we have 10 of them, right, 10 divided by four would be 2.5. So we, for every one NADH, we can make 2.5 ATPs. For every FADH2, we get six protons, and six protons can be used to make 1.5 ATPs. Okay, so that's our, our bookkeeping number. An NADH can make 2.5, FADH2 can make 1.5. Okay. So we can kind of add up this uh, ATP yield from the complete oxidation of gluco glucose. Right? Glycolysis, we make two ATPs directly, okay? but we, we also generate two NADHs. Okay. Depending on how uh, we shuttle these to the mitochondria, um, the final number of ATPs can either be three or five. Um, for simplicity's sake, let's just say these are NADHs, so they, they, they're worth 2.5 ATPs. So you can think of that as five um, ATPs, okay? But it, it really, it depends on how since this is from the cytosol, it depends how they get in the mitochondria, okay? Um, the next step, since they're in the mitochondria, are easier, right? The pyruvate dehydrogenase complex will form for every molecule of glucose, we'll get two molecules of pyruvate. For each molecule of pyruvate that goes through this, we get an NADH, so that's a total of two NADHs, right? That'll make five ATPs. The citric acid cycle 
right? For every two turns of that, we're going to have six NADHs, two FADH2s, right? So that's, you know, 15 ATPs from the NADHs alone and, and three ATPs from our FADH2s, succinate dehydrogenase. Okay, so that's an enormous amount. And we remember we get those GD, GTPs um, directly, but, you know, that the, the amount of ATP and that we're, we're making from substrate level phosphorylations in these these pathways is very small compared to the the amount we're getting from NADHs. Okay, so in total for per glucose, we we can make 32 a maximum of 32 ATPs. Okay, that's a you know very large number. Okay, and and this is sort of explaining um, how get, you get the NADH into the mitochondria, um, right, depending on, you know, what tissue you're in primarily. So liver, kidney, and heart, you're using this, what's known as the malate aspartate shuttle. Um, it's a little bit complex, but what you're doing is you're... Um, you have uh, malate dehydrogenase, which takes oxaloacetate, um, and your reduced NADH from glycolysis. Okay, you, you convert oxaloacetate into malate. Okay, and then you reoxidize um, malate back to oxaloacetate inside the mitochondria, and, and that generates your NADH inside the mitochondria. Okay, so that. Um, and then you have, you know, this whole other part with glutamate and alpha-ketoglutarate, and these are um, both of these are uh, anti-porters. Um, so it, it's a very complex system, but what you're doing, the net result is what, of what you're doing is you're taking an NADH that's on the uh, outside of the mitochondria, and you're putting it in the inside in the matrix. Okay, so that's a direct conversion. The net effect is, is just a, a direct conversion you're of moving NADH from the outside to the inside. Okay, so in, the, in those cases, um, you get a full, the full amount of ATP produced from that. Okay. Uh, in, in muscle and brain, um, skeletal muscle and brain, you use that, uh, what we've kind of mentioned just briefly before this glycerol, 3-phosphate dehydrogenase, you use this, um, this system. And that goes through a, an FAD cofactor and into ubiquinone pool. Uh, and, and that's why you can, um, you can see um, a reduction in the amount of ATP produced, right? Because what you're really doing is you're converting this NADH into an FADH2. So now instead of 2.5 ATPs, it, it's going to make 1.5. That, I mean, those two figures are really showing you why there's this difference right here in the NADH is derived from glycolysis, why there's this um, bookkeeping um, difference between those two. Okay, these complexes aren't just kind of spread out randomly in the, the inner membrane of the mitochondria. They associate together, and, and they associate into to super complexes known as uh, a respirosome. Okay. You have multiple copies of, of each of these complexes closely packed together in lipid rif, uh, rafts. So you have these membrane lipid rafts that have multiple complexes together. Okay. And, and why is that? Well, you don't want... Um, you don't want these these complexes, right? They're transferring electrons and then into ubiquinone. You don't want that ubiquinone, you know, just flying around and ha have to cross a, a, a long distance before it gets to its target. You want them to be, you know, fairly close together. Okay? Being close together also makes it a lot easier to regulate, okay? And when you're creating this proton gradient, uh, right, the complexes... Um, one, three, and four making this proton gradient, you don't want the protons to have to diffuse a far away 
to to find a complex five to go back through the membrane because they're probably just as likely to diffuse out of the the inner membrane space into the cytosol as well because that outer membrane is pretty porous right protons can go through that those pores in that that membrane so you want complex five to be very close to these other complexes right and so to do that you use these 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 super complexes are, are located very close in, in, in membrane la rafts uh, cardiolipin if, if you remember from chapter 10 um, it's one of those um, lipids that's important in um, membrane rafts and it's in high concentration in the uh, inner mitochondrial membrane okay its absence, either by removing it by detergent or in, in yeast strains that are deficient for cardiolipin, results in defective mitochondrial electron transfer and the loss of affinity between the respiratory complexes. So it is, um, you know, this whole system can be kind of thrown into a loop because you're missing a, a particular membrane lipid. Uh, this kind of shows you um, just some some real world research data, how these these super complexes um, form and, and how many um, um, subunits are in each. So here we have uh, molecular weight, you know, really huge molecular weights, and these these bands here represent some the super complexes, and then these smaller bands here are the individual complexes that that are in them okay and then some other things that uh, and so these are these are western blots too i should point out so they have antibodies specific to certain proteins uh, these are acyl coa dehydrogenases that are involved in fatty acid oxidation uh, also etf that's involved in that okay and so they found though uh, presence of those proteins in these super complexes as well and so these proteins you know are, are generally considered to be soluble proteins right not membrane bound proteins but they're also found in these these super complexes which isn't surprising right because you, you want you don't want things to have to travel you know long distances again so the the proteins involved in, in fatty acid metabolism, amino acid metabolism, and even the citric acid cycle are, are going to be um, involved in, in parts of these super complexes. A and that also uh, indicates that the, the proton gradient is really going to be local to the part of the membrane that has this super complex in it. Okay, moving on to section three, it will talk a little bit about the regulation of, of the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, primarily it's regulated by substrate availability. The, the starting electron donors, right, NADH and FADH2, and then also the um, ADP and inorganic phosphate that it needs to make ATP, and as well as the that terminal electron acceptor O2. So if you're missing any of those, this whole system is going to stop. Okay, and the probably the easiest one, um, right? Oxygen. When you don't have oxygen, right? You you're um, it's obviously a bad thing, and it's a bad thing because this whole oxidative phosphorylation, your ability to make ATP at, at a high level stops. Okay. Um, all of these again are coupled. So all of these are required for electron transport and ATP synthesis. So you, if, you, if you don't have ADP uh, and inorganic phosphate, right, it doesn't just mean you can't make ATP, it means that you can't transfer electrons either. Okay, and, and vice versa. Okay, inhibition of this system leads to the accumulation of, of NADH, your, your starting substrate, and that causes feedback inhibition to cascade all the way up to PFK1 in glycolysis. 
And, and why is that important? Well, you don't want to um, you don't want to be um, making ATP uh, f- faster than it's used um, to get you know like a, a buildup of ATP in the cell. So you want to form ATP only as fast as you're using it. Okay. And then the, the last method of, of regulation that we'll talk about are the, the inhibition of complex 5 through the F1 um, uh, moiety of complex 5 and, and by an inhibitor. So an IF1 inhibitor uh, is, is expressed during hypoxia. So times of low oxygen you'll get an expression of this if1 inhibitor and it prevents complex 5 from going in reverse so if if you don't have um, any oxygen around what's going to happen is you're going to uh, electron transport transfer isn't going to happen um, and and you might get um, the the proton mode of force will, will not be generated and you could get a, a situation where you 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 can run complex five in reverse, which would then be be breaking apart ATP, and you don't want that to happen. So IF one just simply kind of stops complex five from rotating backwards. Okay, so substrate regulation, oxidation, uh, oxidative phosphorylation, um, right? So you need NADH around, um, you need um, your AD, ADP and in, in, in inorganic phosphate, you also need oxygen. Okay, so that, uh, having those around will, will turn this on. Having excess amounts of, of either NADH or ATP will sort of feed back um, into these other pathways, right? If you have a lot of ATP, you're gonna stop um, a lot of these other steps in these pathways that we've, we've previously discussed. So you're not gonna be generating those, um, the reduced cofactors, right? So this, I think substrate level regulation of oxidative phosphorylation is, is pretty simple, pretty self-explanatory. In, in conditions of high NADH or high ATP, you, this sort of stops because you don't have those the being generated as much because you're stopping all these other steps before. Um, you really need um, NADH, um, your ADP and in, in inorganic phosphate, and you need oxygen uh, for this to, to occur. Okay, so regulation during low oxygen, as I mentioned, it's the IF1 inhibitor, and it's, it's an alpha helix. It's um, kind of a, a dimer of alpha helices that will wedge itself between two F1, F1, um, pieces of two complex fives, right? So in, in, in these super complexes, you have complex two complex fives that are pretty close to each other, and you can get this IF1 inhibitor that wedges in there. Okay, again, this is during hypoxia, low oxygen concentration. Um, when no oxygen is around, F1 can catalyze the reverse reaction, the hydrolysis of ATP, okay? This is only active at lower pHs um, that are encountered when electron transport is stalled. So if, if you stall uh, electron transport, you're not getting the protons moving from the matrix. Okay, so the, the pH of the matrix will actually in, uh, decrease a bit and that will make IF1 uh, active. Uh, this protein is normally disordered right, but forms a helix when the pH gets, gets low enough and becomes uh, an active inhibitor. Okay. So some other regulation during low oxygen. 
we have uh, the increased transcription of what's known as HIF1, which is hypoxia-inducible factor. Right, so hypoxia-inducible factor, HIF1, is a little bit different than IF1. Um, right, so the IF1 inhibitor is for complex 5. HIF1 does a number of things, but, but one thing it does is it increases a, uh, the, de the degradation of a part of complex 4 what's known as the COX, which is cytochrome oxidase uh, subunit 4, okay? And it replaces it with um, the, the COX 4-2 subunit, okay? And, and that, that change of subunits in complex 4, right, the 4-2, the COX 4-2 is adapted to a lower amount of oxygen okay so that's um one of the ways that this this um, hypoxia inducible factor changes uh, respiration in term for a low oxygen environment okay um, some other things that happen uh, glucose transporter uh, production increases to get more glucose through the cell, right? Because with no oxygen, you're relying on glycolysis to produce ATP. So more glucose, more glycolytic enzymes, so you're going to up your production of ATP that way. You also need to uh, express more lactate dehydrogenase, right? Because that's how you're recycling the NAD for glycolysis to continue without oxygen. And then you also increase um, the, the pyruvate uh, dehydrogenase kinase, which turns off the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Because if you have lower concentrations of oxygen, you don't want to be sending stuff through um, the citric acid cycle and the respiratory chain because you, you just don't have that oxygen available. Okay, so the last part of this class, you're going to talk about other functions of mitochondria. Okay. Um, one is the production of, of steroid hormones, and that's by a protein known as cytochrome P450. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about the mitochondria's role in apoptosis, and then maybe a little bit about heat generation. And so all of these are just sort of, um, you know, very small little pieces. Okay, so you're, you're, you're really not going to be responsible for this information in a great amount of detail on an exam. But there, there are, you know, other important functions of mitochondria that you probably should know something about. Okay, we'll start with heat generation. Okay, and this is primarily in, in fat tissues. Okay, the, the movement of this uh, electrons, um, this downhill flow of energy actually does reduce, uh, release quite a bit of heat. Okay. And so if you, if you uncouple that electron transfer with ATP synthesis, what you can do is you can move a lot of uh, electrons through this and, and pump protein, protons. And, and it's sort of like wasting energy, but you're wasting that energy to give off heat. Okay, so that stored energy in, in all of in the reduced electron carriers is, is ultimately released as heat and not to generate ATP. So in, in you know conditions where it's re really cold out, you know your your body can uncouple your electron transfer um, f from ATP synthesis, and it does this by this um, uncoupling protein UCP1. Which, which basically just lets those protons back in. So you're, you can just be shuttling electrons through your complexes. They're pumping protons, but those protons are just coming right back in. Okay, so you're, you're not using them to generate ATP in complex five. Okay. Right, and just as an FYI, it, you know, it's, uh, it's, we get a signal here, when, and when we talked about the beta androgenic receptor, can actually go to to cause um, this uh, protein thermogenin 
uh, in the mitochondria that that is you know basically the same thing as is UCP1, just another name for it. Okay, it, it goes to uh, activate that that pro that protein that channel to to um, decouple electron transfer and and um, ATP synthesis to generate heat. Cytochrome P450, um, it's, it, they're actually a series uh, of enzymes, and they're responsible for the conversion of, uh, actually, they're, they're responsible for quite a bit, but one of the things they do is convert cholesterol into steroid hormones. And they do that um, through electron transfer from NADPH. So we talked about... Um, NADPH is a little bit different than NADH, right? And one of the, the places that we generate NADPH was from the pentose phosphate pathway. Okay, and so those electrons derived from that pathway can be then uh, used to convert um, uh, a number of, of different proteins will transfer these electrons. Um, ultimately, they get to cytochrome P450, and uh, that's used to convert, um, you know, certain groups on on cholesterol into, you know, things like uh, hydroxyls, which which then turns them from not just cholesterol but into an actual uh, hormone. Okay. Um, Cytochrome P450s are also responsible for, you know, the uh, detoxifying uh, inside the cell. Uh, they're really kind of a a general enzyme that that reacts with with other smaller molecules, um, adding things like OHs uh, to them to make them more soluble and being able to uh, actually then be able to excrete them. Okay. So in the endoplasmic reticulum, um, they inactivate what are, what are known as uh, xenobiotic compounds from outside the cell. Um, things like drugs, right? You take, a, you know, like a, a prescription medication, and, and those um, drug molecules are, are usually deactivated um, by, by cytochrome P450 uh, in, in the liver, okay? And, and the whole thing is it's adding oxygen groups to make them more hydrophilic, more soluble, and easier to excrete. Right, and this table, you, you won't be responsible for knowing this table, um, but it just kind of shows you how you can get cholesterol and, and change it, and it kind of highlights where these changes are occurring. Okay, you're... you're you're adding oxygens or, or changing a ketone to an alcohol in different places, and you can get these various steroid hormones. Okay. All right, the final thing we'll talk about is uh, the fact that reactive oxygen species can damage uh, biomolecules. In Reactive oxygen species can be generated in the, this respiratory com complexes. Um, you're transferring electrons, and if anything goes wrong with that, that transfer, right, you can get what are known as reactive oxygen species. So let's say a, a ubiquinone is in the semiquinone form instead of the fully reduced ubiquinol form. Oxygen can react with that. And, and then take um, that unpaired electron in the form of uh, a superoxide, okay? And superoxide then reacts and forms things like hydroxyl radicals, um, which both superoxide and uh, hydroxide ra radical can be very damaging to um, stuff like DNA I inside the cell. So you don't really want those around. And the body has a... Uh, a pretty unique, uh, cool system to protect against this. Um, it has a, a protein known as superoxide dismutase, 
that when it encounters superoxide, will will convert it to um, hydrogen peroxide, which again is pretty um, damaging. But then there's another protein called uh, glutathione peroxidase, which converts the the peroxide into water um, through the use of of glutathione. Okay, and so our glutathione, um, the reduced form of glutathione shown here, can can be oxidized and and converted to what is abbreviated as GSSHG. So you have two glutathione molecules, in a sense, stuck together by a disulfide. Okay. Okay. You need to recycle that glutathione um, back to the reduced form um, using a molecule called a uh, protein called glutathione reductase. And it, um, to do that, it uses NADPH. So we sort of alluded to this, this pathway earlier um, when we talked about the, the pentose phosphate pathway. But yeah, that's another important use of NADPH. Okay. Uh, again, reactive oxygen species can cause damage because they can react with DNA. Um, the DNA, um, the damage to the DNA can then be passed on um, to further generations. They can also react with proteins that can lead to apoptosis. Okay, and so one, one way apoptosis can occur is when the mitochondria release cytochrome C. Okay, so normally cytochrome C is on the inner membrane space, but you know certain things uh, like DNA damage, um, stress, reactive oxygen species, or even sometimes developmental signals can cause the outer membrane of the mitochondria to become even more permeable and you can get a release of cytochrome C from the mitochondria. When that happens, um, what one of the, the reasons this causes apoptosis in the cell is that cytochrome C can then bind with other uh, proteins that are involved in apoptosis and make what is known as this complex called the apoptosome. Okay? And so this apoptosome then becomes active and it signals, okay, this cell, um, through a number of different pathways, this cell is ready for um, destruction. Right, so apoptosome can activate uh, pro-caspase-9 into caspase-9. Right, that becomes active, and it, it activates a number of other caspases that signal cell death. Okay. Again, not super important for a class. Um, I bring this up because you'll see this this name, uh, pro caspase and caspase. Um, the pro is the inactive form, um, and caspase really tells you that it has a a function in apoptosis. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, mention just briefly uh, something about mitochondrial DNA, right? Mitochondrial DNA is circular DNA like bacterial DNA. Again, there are only 13 subunits that are encoded, protein subunits encoded in mitochondrial DNA. Okay, they're color coded here, um, you know, complex one, complex three, complex four, uh, and then complex five. Um, there's some ribosomal RNA as well and transfer RNA encoded. Right. And, and that brings up um, the whole idea of, you know, you might have heard mitochondrial DNA is a, a way to, you know, track your, your maternal lineage. Um, one of the, the tough parts about um, if, you, if you study mutations in any of these mitochondrial encoded DNA subunits is that there's this idea of, of heteroplasmy. So some of the DNA uh, in your mitochondria can be mutated. So some of the, the mitochondria you have in your cell can have this mutant DNA, while others can have wild type. Okay, And when your cell divides, the, the number of mitochondria that, ha that are given the mutant 
DNA and, and the numbers that are given the wild type DNA can vary. And so you can get um, a large discrepancy uh, and some cells um, might have full wild type DNA, others might have largely mutant. And so that's why mitochondrial DNA um, diseases can be so, uh, so their symptoms can be so um, drastically different. And that's because the, um, the amount of, of the mutant DNA passed on from, from, you know, parent to uh, offspring can be so, so different. It, it makes a sometimes mitochondrial DNA disease is hard to actually um, identify. So the chapter 19 summary, um, really the important parts are the, the details on electron transport and ATP synthesis. Um, what we covered after there, you, you would you know, potentially be responsible for that on an exam, but obviously um, not in, in, in so much detail. Okay, so that uh, is the, the last material covered in the, the class this quarter. Um, the final, just a reminder, the final, you can use notes on the final, uh, one sheet of notes. So um, just be prepared for that. Um, and because of that, you, you might see some other questions, um, maybe asking for more details, um, maybe even some potentially potentially some questions where you'd have to, you know, draw, draw a structure or something and, and, and take a picture of that and email me um, on the exam that we, we didn't see before. Okay.